there is a sense of urgency that is lacking from our dialogue about education. We hear about how schools are lacking in resources. We hear how some kids lack the family and home support they need to succeed. We hear about how an individual teacher can have a profound influence on a kid's life. We hear a lot about the need for accountability and testing. And if you work with teenagers like I do, you hear how we need to provide more food all the time throughout the school day. <laughs> what we're not hearing about, though, is the reality gap. We have a two-part crisis in the field of education, a crisis of impact, are we really reaching kids, and of relevance, are we giving them what they need to know for the 21st century? The fact is, huge numbers of young people go to school every day only because they have to, in a system that research has shown reduces, not increases, their curiosity and creativity over time. Many of our brightest, most capable kids are disengaged because education does not have meaning for them. At the same time, we're facing unprecedented and profound changes in the world around us. Whether it's habitat loss, militarism, technological change, economic injustice, climate crisis, these things are changing the way we live our lives. And yet, 15 years into the new millennium, these topics are barely mentioned in schools. I went to school, high school, in the last millennium, at a time when these huge changes were just glimmers on a distant horizon. The one class I took in four years that had the most relevance was an English class that focused on current events, and it was unfortunately a class that most of my fellow students slept through. So I was introduced to this reality gap at age 17, and I've been working to bring education and the real world together ever since. Now a generation has gone by and the need has become urgent. We need to grab kids by the shirt and say, hey, these things matter. This stuff matters, you matter. We need you. Because of these profound changes, we're asking for your very best effort. Asking them for things is different from telling them things. Most schools say, here kid, here's what you need to know. I suggest we go to kids and say, how can your talents and creativity and inventiveness make the greatest possible difference in the world. In short, I'm advocating for an education that truly impacts kids and gives them the tools to be present and powerful in today's world. This is not a purely theoretical goal. I run a school with, a, with the help of some really awesome teachers. I run a school called Explorations Academy that prepares young people to be global citizens and change agents. In the limited time I have today, I'd like to introduce three sets of tools that we can use to begin closing that reality gap and making education matter. The first set of tools is personal. I often ask kids, how much control do you have over your emotions? Do they just happen to you like the weather? Do you have some control over them? Or can you choose your emotional landscape as you see fit? This line of questioning opens a dialogue about what does it take to get that kind of self-control? Well, the answer is, they get that self-control, we get that self-control, by learning to recognize and then direct the inner stories that are going on in our heads all the time. We all have these inner scripts, right? We all have stuff going on in the head. Well, the stories we tell ourselves are the narrative that becomes our life story. And too often, the inner scripts that we're reading to ourselves reinforce barriers to learning, like fear and embarrassment. Um, by learning to become conscious of this process, we can choose courage and compassion instead. It's a wonderful thing to see when a young person stops telling herself she's limited and lets her personal power blossom. Now, some would say the last thing we want to do is give teenagers more personal power. But we all need this power. We are each the author of our own life. Nobody has ever overcome adversity, whether it's a sailor lost at sea, single mom working three jobs, person struggling against cancer, without con creating an inner script and convincing themselves that they could do it. So if we can use our inner stories to overcome adversity, we can use our inner stories to overcome complacency. Now, there are those who say this inner work, does this stuff belong in schools? No, kids need to focus more on their schoolwork and less on themselves. I say absolutely not, because the more grounded a kid becomes, 
the more able they are to deal with complicated academic subjects like geopolitics, comparative religion, nanotechnology, things that bring the complexity of that real world to life in the classroom. So while some, thank you, so while some uh, schools emphasize academic rigor, which means stiffness, I suggest we focus on academic vigor, which means life. The second set of tools I'd like to speak to briefly is social. Now, we want kids to have more personal power, sure, but their personal power exists in a social context. So, closing the reality gap means building strong interpersonal skills. Teenagers are wired to focus on relationships. They're learning how to get along with each other, whether we teach them to or not. And you can look at the common peer culture that's common in many high schools to see what happens when we don't teach them. So I suggest that it's time for schools to embrace curricula in areas such as cross-cultural communication, leadership, conflict resolution. Turns out, young people benefit from being held to high standards, not just academically, but in their relationships as well. It's also important to de-emphasize competition and emphasize cooperation in schools. That way we can build co uh, cooperative, respectful learning communities in which every individual is valued and the group can focus on genuine issues. Learning communities can take place anywhere, not just in schools. Gallup reports that seven in 10 Americans are disengaged at work. Seven in 10. That is a symptom of this educational crisis. So what kind of workplaces help us to collaborate and to heal and to move forwards? Maybe your workplace is one of them. If it's not, I suggest you look into learning communities. What, could, what would it take to make your workplace such a place? I once taught a class in nonviolent communication to a group of kids. And uh, uh, a couple days after I taught the class, I got a call, a complaint call from the father of one of my kids. Now, this is a guy I, I respect a lot, very smart man, a therapist by profession. He says, I want to complain about that stuff you're teaching our kids. Okay, lay it on me. He says, well, my son and I got into an argument last night, and he handled it better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> so kids in this kind of collaborative environment develop uh, interpersonal skills, sometimes even beyond that, beyond those of their parents. Um, so the uh, third set of tools I'd like to speak to are global. Kids today, all of us, are immersed in a thick soup of electronic media. We're never far from our devices, and our exposure to entertainment and news and communication is constant. But do our devices connect us to the world, with the world, or isolate us? I think they can do both. But as educators, it's time for us to focus on immediate experience, not mediated experience. This means getting kids out of the classroom a lot into direct exposure with nature and with culture, becoming part of the current of current events instead of caught in an institutional backwater going around in circles. More importantly, those immediate experiences give kids a sense that they can influence the world that they are part of. It's critical. It's also really important that we expose kids to other cultures. The world is far too complex to be understood by American kids who never leave America. So in my line of work, we bring kids on expeditions to other parts of the world, to developing countries for a month at a time, where kids engage in service projects and meaningful interaction with locals and academic study. I once had a group of kids in Nicaragua, where we spent most of our time in a very poor uh, rural village. And uh, each evening, we would have an uh, evening circle and reflect on the things we saw and learned. This one kid, Ryan, uh, had a comment for, for the group one of our last evenings there. He said, you know, I expected these people to be really different from us, and they're not. They're really a lot like us. What's different is that they're content despite how poor they are. When I get back to the United States, I'm going to have to think differently about my life and my choices. That's education. Now, there are some who, again, would say, well, kids aren't ready for this. They need more of a foundation before they deal with global issues. I think that misunderstands the teenage mind. Kids want authenticity. They don't want watered down, sanitized information, and they love being asked questions to which adults do not have the answer. <laughs> so what about that reality gap? We largely accept a school system that is better at schooling than it is at educating. 
we add information to kids' lives year after year in a process called accretion. Now, accretion is how stalactites form. Drip, 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 year after year. Accretion is also the name for how coral reefs form in the ocean. Well, that process works great in wa under, underwater or in caves, but we're talking about human lives here. We need to come up with a living form of education that really draws kids out, really engages them, and gives them what they need to know to be effective in this complex new century. Schools can't change overnight, I know. But education has got to be more than the accretion of information. For us to have a positive future, it is prerequisite that we close the reality gap and make education impactful and relevant. You can be part of this. Um, educator or not, we can all choose to become powerful learners. Make yourself more of a verb than a noun by embracing a dynamic inner script that maximizes your ability to affect change. Expand your creativity. Bring more of your life to your relationships. Engage in global issues. The world needs this of you because we cannot raise powerful and aware kids without becoming powerful and aware adults. Power and awareness come in many forms. I once gave a kid named Steve a broom. I said, hey, can you go sweep that classroom? Sure, no problem. Comes back. Steve comes back one minute later. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. He's like, yeah, I swept that classroom. Like, yeah, I don't think, no, I swept it. Well, it turns out the word sweep has two meanings. One meaning is to move a broom back and forth. The other meaning is to clean a floor using a broom. So I went back there with Steve and worked with him to get the job done properly. Well, education has two meanings also. The one we've been using is putting kids in school day after day, year after year. I suggest the following. Education is the process of transforming our capacity as human beings. This means giving young people and developing for ourselves the capacity to make positive change happen in ourselves and in our world. Like Steve with the broom, we need to achieve results and we need to do it now. This is our challenge. And I invite you to rewrite your script, revitalize your life, and make education matter.